Hello folks, in this video I'm going to continue backtesting this trading strategy in Python. In a previous video I got as far as downloading the historical data for the S&P 500 and I'd done some initial processing with it by calculating the daily return, the balance, the annual return and the overall drawdown. So now I can start to actually test the trading strategy itself. Now remember this strategy is a moving average strategy, so before I do anything else I need to calculate what that moving average is. So I'll come down here and I'll calculate moving average. And I will do this in yet another column. So I'll add into my data frame the column called SMA, which stands for simple moving average. And the moving average is the average of the close prices. So I need price.close. And here I'm going to use a pandas method, which uh, makes this very easy to calculate. So this is going to be rolling. And in here I need to define the window. So the window is just going to be the duration of the period, the length of the period that I want to use for my average. Now remember, I already defined this right in the start up here when I defined my initial variables and I plan to use a 200 day moving average. So that means it's going to take the previous 200 days worth of price closes, average them out and give me a number. So in this window, I can just put in period. And then lastly, of course, this is a moving average. So I need to calculate that average from this. So I'll say dot mean. And then just to see what's actually happening and visualize it, I'm going to output that. So I'll say price.tail. And this is very useful. Uh, and one of the reasons why Jupyter Notebook is quite handy for this is that between each of these cells, you can just quickly test your data and just see that everything's working the way it should be by just putting out the head, tail, or just the entirety, uh, you know, the start and the end of your data frame. So in this case, I just want to see the tail. And if I run this, I run this down here. I can see I've still got my columns from before and now I have this SMA, which is calculating the moving average. So I can compare that to my close price and you can see this doesn't really change that much. It's very, very slowly going up, even though the price is fluctuating uh, up and down by seven points here, going down 10 points here and down even more here. The moving average is reacting to quite slowly. So we can actually visualize all this on the chart. So we can say here, plot chart with moving average overlaid. Uh, now, first of all, I want to plot my uh, close prices. So price.close, this is just going to be basically the price chart for the S&P 500. But over on top of it, I want to overlay the SMA, which is my moving average. So if I output this saying plt.show, you will see that chart coming up now. So I've got the previous price data. Now you can compare that to what I had before. It's exactly the same information, but on top of it, I have this new orange line, which is the moving average. Now notice that it doesn't start right at the beginning. And the reason for that is this needs 200 days worth of data before you can calculate anything. So for those first 200 days, there are no values in it. Only after that does it start to have enough information to be able to calculate something. And you can also see that it's quite slow to react to everything. So although the prices are kind of jaggy up and down, it doesn't really follow them that accurately. It's quite smooth as it goes up. And that's just because it's taking so much data into it. Now, if I change that period to a smaller number, so instead of saying that 200 day period, let's uh, let's say uh, 15, I need to rerun this code up here. And then I can rerun this section here. You can see that the moving average is almost directly on top of the price. So it's moving uh, it's following much more closely. So that is the difference between these slow and fast moving averages. So let's just put that uh, variable back in here, rerun this cell and then rerun this one underneath it. And it's back to how it was before. All right, so now I've got the average, I can start looking for trades. And remember the trading rules for the system are very straightforward. Uh, there is really only one or well, say two rules. And the rule is that when the price crosses above the moving average. So whenever the blue line goes above the orange one, we go long. So we buy into the S&P 500 and we follow the ups and downs of it. And then as soon as it crosses back down below it, then we exit the market and we wait for the next cross. So there would be a buy here and you would hold up until about this point where you would sell again, you'd buy back into it again when it crosses and so on. So every time it goes up uh, or down beyond the moving average, that's the only times when a trade changes. So I want to be able to calculate or be able to track when I enter into the market and when these trades happen. So for that, I can add in another series here, uh, which is going to track all that for me. So we'll say create 
uh, entry signals. And I'll call this, again, I'll call the data frame price, and then I'll call this column long. So long is just going to be whenever I am in the market. And this one is essentially just saying that whenever the price is above the moving average, that means that it's crossed over it. So we're in the market. So I just say price.close divided by price.sma. Now again, let's output some of this data and see what it actually looks like. So let's say price.tail, uh, let's output 20 rows just to get a bit more information. Uh, and see, oh, I've not done that right at all. That's not supposed to say divide. That's meant to be greater than. I'm quoting and I'm speaking at the same time. So let's try that again. Okay, so now I'm actually getting Boolean values here. I'm getting either a true or a false. And the true value is whenever the price is above the moving average. So you can see for the majority of this, say, last, uh, well, yeah, from about 2012 on to 2015, the price is above the moving average. And that's kind of reflected here because it's pretty much constantly long into the market. So the SMA is here. So that's my moving average. And then the close price is here. So you can see that it's well above the simple moving average. So of course, this is giving me a true value and it's going long. Uh, I can display the head. And remember at that point, it won't have calculated anything because I don't have a moving average yet. So all of these values are, well, there is no, no value there. So the long variable or this long series is just giving me false for all of these entries here. So let's just change that back to tail and continue this one. Okay, so now I know when I'm entering the market, I know when the price, or rather I know when the system is trading and when it's not. So how do I calculate the return from this system? Well, I need to look for positions when this long variable or this long column is giving me true values. So whenever that is true, then I'm gonna be taking daily return because at that point I'm in the market and essentially I am following the return of the S&P 500. But when I am out of the market, then I don't make any return, but I also don't make any loss. So my daily return would just be one, i.e. it doesn't go up or it goes down. So to do that, I can use NumPy. So let's say calculate the daily system return. So I'll add another column. I'll call this sys underscore ret for system return. And as I said, I'm going to use NumPy. So I'll say NP where. Uh, essentially, this is going to take a condition and then it's going, to get, uh, it's going to take two arguments after that, which are going to be what value I want when the condition is true and what value I want when the condition is false. So let's say the condition I'm looking for is whenever my long uh, column, whenever this column is giving me an entry signal. So whenever this says true, that means that I want to go long. But remember, these close prices are at the end of the day. So the moving average is also calculated at the end of the day, and that signal is generated at the end of the day. So of course, I can't enter at that point. I enter on the next day. So I enter at the open of the day after my signal because this is, cal this is calculated and generated when the market closes the day before. So to do that, I need to actually be looking backwards by one day. So I'm entering today if the previous day gave me a long signal. So I need to say in here, shift by one. So rather than looking at today's value, I'm actually looking at yesterday's value. So I'm shifting this up by one. And if that value is true, then the return, as I said, is just going to be whatever the, the daily return of the S&P is. So if I got a trade signal yesterday, then I'm going to enter at the open. I will exit at the close for that day. So that is the return that I'm going to make on that day. But of course, these continue being true. So I just continue entering and exiting, or in theory, I just continue holding. So all of these returns apply. So I say price dot return. And if this value is false, then I don't have a return. I don't go up or go down. So my return is just going to be 1.0. So again, let's just display this. So price.tail and run this code. So now, uh, of course, it's gonna be difficult to demonstrate this because pretty much all of these are gonna be true up until, uh, I don't know how far I have to go back to find this little value here where it changes to false. But you can see that it's giving me a system return that is exactly the same as the daily return. 
So now that I have this, I can go through the exact same steps that I did with the benchmark and I can calculate the exact same metrics. So let's say calculate system balance. So I'll say price and this column is going to be sys underscore bal. So just like bench underscore bal. And that one was calculated by taking my starting balance and multiplying it by the balance return or the benchmark return. But in this case, I want my system return. So sysret. And remember, I needed the cumulative product of that. So again, let's say price.tail. And this is going to show me the last five, oops, last five entry points. And here we go. So you can see the benchmark balance here and you can see the system balance alongside it. So it's actually showing that the system balance is going to finish up in a worse position than the benchmark balance, which is just holding the S&P 500. But without going into the detail a bit more, which I'm about to do, it's hard to say what's really going on behind the scenes there. So like I did with the balance previously, I drew a plot of it just to see how it changes over time. Now, of course, at that time, it was following the S&P exactly. So it looked exactly the same as the price chart. But the system balance is going to be looking a little different. So I can compare the two side by side. So here I can say PLT plot price dot benchmark balance. And then I also want to plot price dot system balance. So let's show that plot onto the screen. And now you can see the comparison of them side by side. So a lot of the times, especially this last few years, like I said, this is where the price is constantly above the moving average. You can see that they move pretty much in tandem. Although one is lower than the other because of the starting point, they move pretty much in the exact same way. But notice there's an important difference here. When the uh, when we had that crash between 2008 and 2009, the price chart dropped quite significantly. And if I go back up to where I can see the moving average, you can see that it drops well below it. So as soon as that's happened, that's triggering that we exit the market. So at that point, I'm no longer going long. And that's why this line is just completely stationary. So at this point, the return is just one. There is no profit and there is no loss. So what this is showing is that although overall the return is not quite as good, potentially it did avoid some of this downturn from before. So let's compare some of the metrics. So first of all, let's calculate them just the same way as I did above for the, uh, the benchmark. Now I'll come up here to where I've calculated my benchmark uh, return and annual return. And I'll just copy that down just to save me having to retype it all again. But I just need to change the information here. So instead of bench, it's now system return. And uh, just change that one as well to system. And all of these pretty much just directly change over to sys underscore bal. This one as well. And this one down here. Everything else stays the same. It's the same duration, same period. I just need to make sure I change this as well. Sys return. And assuming I've not made any mistakes here, if we run this, I get my information here. So uh, that's my system return overall, 62.63%. And that's the annualized return, 4.98. So if you compare them, it is lower. It is a lower return uh, than the benchmark. However, I want to also compare the downside, not just the upside. So let's calculate the drawdown. Well, I've already calculated that drawdown for the benchmark. So let's just go up here and there it is there. Let's just copy that all down and then just change it for system. So I'll say, and that's going to be system peak. So sys peak and sys bal bench drawdown. So system drawdown price system balance minus system peak. I'm sure there's a shortcut for this that I'm not using. Uh, system drawdown, system peak. Okay, and then just need to output the system DD. All right, so that's showing a drawdown of 20%, uh, which seems about right. It's hard to figure out exactly where it is because it's not quite as obvious as this one, but at some point along the line, maybe from there to there, uh, from there to there, it dropped 20%. So if we compare that with the uh, with the benchmark, uh, which I've lost, it's up here now, 52%, that's a significantly uh, less severe drawdown using this system. Now, it'd be nice to be able to compare these side by side. At the moment, I've kind of just got them output in at the end of these, uh, at the end of these 
cells. I've, uh, I've typed this up over here, so I'm just going to copy this from my snippets just to save me having to retype it all out. Uh, so let's run this now. It should be using all the same variables as I did before. So it's giving me everything side by side here. So the total return for the benchmark, which is just holding the S&P, is 83.68, which I calculated before. The system is a bit less. Uh, so, of course, the uh, annual return as well is, uh, is going to be less. But notice the drawdown is significantly uh, well, significantly better, I suppose. Now, there are a lot of other metrics that you can go into more detail and calculate here. Uh, but I think as a start point, this gives some quick indication of what kind of numbers you can expect from a trading system. It just allows you to quickly test this out and to see what the actual results would be before you spend time going into it in more detail and back testing it further and, uh, and so on. The important thing to note, though, however, is that this back test doesn't include a lot of things. There's a lot of assumptions here. So the main ones are the fact that I haven't taken into account trading fees. So if you just have a buy and hold system, well, you only buy it once and uh, when you sell once. Whereas if you are going to be trading frequently, this system doesn't seem too bad. It doesn't seem to trade all that often because the moving average is quite a slow one. So it doesn't cross over all that many times. Uh, but regardless, every time there is a trade or a transaction happening, there's going to be trading fees. On top of that, there's going to be slippage and, and all sorts of other factors that need to be considered. So it just gives you a quick comparison of whether or not this method uh, does what potentially it, it may claim to do. Uh, but I think typically a moving average system, just by its nature, is all it's doing is just showing you what the price is currently doing. So it's not really predicting a whole lot. Uh, I think it's just an indication of where the price is heading relative to where it's been because that's all this price uh, this moving average is it just shows you a smoother version of your price chart so that's it for this video uh, i hope you found this useful and thanks for watching